if you're grateful for the grace of God? I don't know about you, but I need God's grace every single day of my life. Maybe I'm the only one, but I make a lot of messes in life, and I need grace for that. Amen? I need grace to get up in the morning. I need grace to do what I do. I need grace to carry on. Grace to deal with trials, tribulations, tests, all things that could, the people who are going through the hurricane season right now, they need some grace. Amen? Here's the good news about grace. When everything else is lost, grace can always be found. And we pray right now that the grace of God would just touch the lives of the people that need it most. Because we know how much we need it, and they need it even more than we do right now. I bring you uh, a grateful heart and many thanks from Pastor Chris Lewis and his church. Because of your generosity, we were able to sow about $30,000, just a little bit under $30,000, into the hurricane relief area. Plus, we took part in filling four tractor trailers of supplies. Amen. Two have already made it down there. A couple more on the way. And uh, in the upcoming weeks, we'll keep you up to date on what else we can do um, because Florida is going to need some help as well now. And uh, I feel a little bit bad for Florida other than the obvious, but uh, so many people have already given, 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 and I'm thinking, where are they going to get the help from? But that's when we know that God is more than enough. Amen? And so uh, we keep them in our prayers, and we are just grateful that we're able to help because one of the reasons why God blesses us is so that we could be a blessing to other people. Isn't that the truth? Well, it's good to see you all. Welcome those of you that are here for the first time, family and friends. If you are here for the first time, we want to invite you after service to our VIP area, like Pastor Chris said, so we can get a uh, chance to say hello to you. We love people. We just want to greet you, um, see who you are. Make sure you leave here with all your questions answered or uh, anything that we can do to be a blessing to you. If you need a Bible, raise your hands. The ushers will get them to you. If you have your Bible, take it out and hold it up nice and high. Uh, we have a custom. We like to declare God's Word over our lives before the service begins or at least the portion of the service where I teach the Word of God begins. So hold it up nice and high and say this out loud with me. This is my Bible. It is my primary source of spiritual nourishment. I will read it every day. And become all God wants me to be. My mind will be renewed. My life will be transformed. I will become fully surrendered to Christ. Therefore, I will hide his word in my heart. So I can be all God's destined me to be. Amen. Would you remain standing in honor of God's word? My text today can be found in 2 Samuel chapter number 12. 2 Samuel chapter number 12. And I'm going to begin reading in verse number 16. The scripture says, David therefore pleaded with God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground. But he would not, nor did he eat food with them. Then on the seventh day came the pass that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him and he would not hear our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm to us. When David saw that his servants were whispering, he perceived what had happened. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Then a servant said to him, what is it that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child who is alive, but when the child is dead, you arose and you ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went into her and lay with her, and she bore him a son, and he called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him, and he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet, so that he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Believe it or not, as somber as that story is, God has led me to this text to share with you about how to be happy. It almost seems like it runs contrary to the text, but I promise you this text is a great backdrop for how to live happy. And we are starting a new series today called Emoji, and um, my emoji of choice today 
is the smiley face because the smiley face is the happy emoji, if you will. And so I want you to do me a favor as you're kind of being seated today. Would you, and I know Pastor Chris overdid this with 19 people, like, you know, I only got seven and I was like, I'm done. So, but I, so I'm going to make it easy for you. Would you just look at three people and say this to them? Can I see your smiley face? Go ahead and tell them. Can I see your smiley face? Can I see your smiley face? Can I see your smiley face? You may be seated. Look at the people who are overambitious. I said three. I didn't say seven. I want to get on with the message and we want to go to the picnic. Anyway, let's go before the Lord and pray. Father, thank you for speaking to us and ministering to each heart individually just as we need to hear it so that it can help us to be everything that you designed us to be. We give you honor in this place in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Emojis are all the rage, aren't they? They are the 21st century form of communication. We no longer talk to each other in words. We don't even text each other in words anymore. We text each other in emojis. They've been around for a long time, since 1999, but only been popular since 2012. They became popular when the iPhone put a keyboard on it that had emojis. Oxford Dictionary officially adopted the word emoji as an official word in 2013. There are at least two known people in the United States that have emoji tattoos. Emoji tattoos. One is an NBA player and the other is Miley Cyrus. She could have put a wrecking ball on herself, but she put an emoji on herself anyway. Some of you are like, what's he talking about? Back up and listen to the tape later. Anyway, the face with tears of joy is the most popular emoji. They actually translated a whole book called Moby Dick into full emoji. True story. There was this guy, he started a Kickstarter campaign, got 3500 bucks to translate the book, and he translated Moby Dick. So now you can read it all in emoji. Some of it doesn't translate, but it works anyway. You can actually turn your selfie into an emoji right now with an app. Can you believe that? Some of you are like, i got to get that app. Don't do it during church. Pay attention. Emojis have actually shown up on Pepsi bottles, and they've been used to deliver entire weather reports in emoji. The Museum of Modern Art in New York City has the original emoji collection. There is 2,735 emojis on record today. If you want to create an emoji, you just can't create one. You've got to go through an approval process to be an official emoji. Over 5 million emojis are sent back and forth every single day, and that's just on Facebook. Can you believe that? Emojis are all the rage. Actually, July 17th every year is the worldwide emoji celebration. It's the birthday of emojis. As you know, there was recently a movie called Emoji. And so with all the emoji phenomenon and craze going around, I figured if you can't beat them, you might as well join them, right? And so we, I said, let's just do a series in church on emojis. I mean, everybody knows emojis. And I said, let's use something so that we can communicate some gospel truth and some biblical truth. And so my emoji of choice today, as I said, is the smiley face. And, and the reason why I want to talk to you about the smiley face or happiness is because I don't know about you, but when I look around, Around, there seems to be a happiness vacuum. Happiness seems to be absent from the lives of so many people. When I look around, I see hurting people and more hurting people than happy people. When I look around, I see hating people more than I see happy people. When I look around, I see hopeless people more than I see happy people. To me, there seems to be this happiness vacuum in our world. And people are searching because of this happiness to be happy. Nowadays, many people want at the top of their list just to be happy. In my research, I found out that Americans now consider happiness to be more important to them than money, more important to them than moral goodness, more important to them than even going to heaven. That's probably why we have a happiness vacuum. Because we put it above moral goodness and heaven, and we put it above money, which maybe not is a bad thing, but moral goodness in heaven. So people will do whatever. Depend, not, it doesn't matter whether it's morally good or not morally good, just because they want to be happy. People say, I don't really care how this impacts my eternity. I just want to be happy. And maybe that's why we have a happiness vacuum. But the point is that people are searching for happiness. And as people search for happiness, maybe you've observed this also, people don't know where to find it. They're looking for happiness in all the wrong places. They look for happiness in relationships, and they look for happiness in, in, in different addictions and different vices and so on and so forth, or in their job or in a hobby. And, and some people, many people look for happiness where? In money, right? 
They think money will make them happy. So I did a little research about that. The top 37% of the Forbes list of wealthiest people in the world are by research. I don't know how they did the research, but this is what it said. Less happier than the average person. Now, you know you can't always believe everything that's online, but that's what the research said anyway. Americans have seen their personal income go up two and a half times in the last 50 years, but their happiness level has stayed the same. Americans earning more than $10 million a year are reportedly only slightly happier than the average person. And I was like, I want proof of concept. I mean, let me, let me try that out. I'll, just, I'll let you know. I don't care what nobody says, you know. But anyway, this is what it says. And whether these facts are true or not true is not really the point. The point is that we know people are searching for happiness, and they can't seem to find it. But here's the good news. The good news is that God wants us to be happy. The good news is God really does want us to be happy. And I remember years ago, I did a, a similar sermon series um, to this teaching. It was called The Science of Happiness. It was similar. This is not a recycled message. I very rarely recycled message, messages, so you're getting this fresh. You don't feel like I cheated and just pulled up something from the past so I could be lazy this week. But I was doing this, this series called The Science of Happiness, and I did it because I read some research that said if you take a two-hour course on happiness, you'll be happier. If you take a 10-hour course on happiness, you'll be significantly more happy. And so I think, well, two hours, 10 hours, one message, it's all got to go in the same direction, making us happier. And when I did the sermon series, this, these biblical watchdogs, self-proclaimed, by the way, biblical watchdogs, got a hold of my sermon series. And they made me the subject of their radio show for three months. Isn't that cool? I'm like, that wasn't good. They, 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 they ripped me up one side and down the other side. But I thought, that's pretty good. When, when, when somebody marks you, that means you're doing something. If, if you ain't never been marked not by nobody, you probably aren't doing what God wants you to do. Because even Jesus had haters, right? And there's a lot of people out there, they drink haterade, and that's all right. They can drink all the haterade they want. We just ignore them and move on with Jesus. In any case, they did this whole three-month program, and I caught wind of it like years later. I was, I was Googling myself. Have you ever Googled yourself? Anybody ever do that? You know, I don't Google myself anymore, but I, because I, I, now, you know, half the stuff is good and half the, uh, so I, I just like, you know, ignore it and, and I don't pay attention to much, much of that stuff. But So I Googled myself and I saw this and it was like on like page 10 or something like that. And it was, you know, uh, Santora, Pastor Santora preaches heresy. By the way, does anybody know what heresy is? Heresy is not when you have a difference of opinion about stuff that really doesn't matter for all of eternity. Her heresy is not like whether you believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit or don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Heresy is not whether you believe God wants you rich or wants you poor. Her heresy is, is not whether you believe in church we ought to have instruments or should just sing a cappella in all hymns. That's not heresy. That's just personal preferences and theological discussions. And heresy is when you teach that there is another way. You claim to be a Christian, but you teach that there is another way to God but through Jesus Christ. That's heresy. And so anyway, they claim that I was teaching, and I really have no issue with this, but it was just kind of fit. They claim that I was preaching heresy because I said God wants us to be happy. Now, I thought to myself, what does he want if he doesn't want us to be happy? How about this? I just need to let you all know God wants you to be sad, very sad. He wants you to be depressed. And every time you're happy, he is going to create something in your life to steal your happiness from them. Come to Jesus because he's a good Savior and he has the best things. And so, and, and caveat, God's highest importance in life is not our happiness. It's our salvation, right? Because sometimes we can be happy about ungodly things. And when we're, when we're unhappy about ungodly things, God can shake up the ungodly things that we're happy about, and it may cause temporary sorrow, but godly sorrow leads to repentance. And we're going to see today, when you lead a life of repentance, you wind up leading a happy life. 
And, and so, so I just want to just share a couple of scriptures because I want you to know this, that God really wants you to be happy. I want you to know that he's a good God. By the way, I hate the God that religion has created. I can't stand him. I don't want to have nothing to do with him. I don't want to hear about him. I don't want to worship him. I don't want to study him. The God that is an ogre and that's out together and that's a killjoy and just basically just does whatever he wants without considering us. I, I don't want to know that God. I want to know the God of the Bible, the God of the Bible that left heaven, laid aside everything for us because he loved us so much. That's the God that I want to know. Psalm 144, verse 15. Are you ready for this? This is in the Bible, right? And I thought, man, self-proclaimed heresy hunters, man, they don't even know the Bible. Psalm 144, verse 15. Happy is that people. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. I was like, have you all ever read your Bible? Before you go criticize somebody about it, have you read your Bible? Have you read what Jesus said? Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, 24, up to now you haven't asked me anything. Jesus was with his disciples, and so whenever they had a need, they'd go right to the source, Jesus. Whenever people saw Jesus, they'd go right to him, and they'd ask him to do all sorts of things, you know, heal me, save me, all that. And the interesting thing about Jesus, who was the expression of the will of God, whenever Jesus was asked by people to help, do you know that Jesus never said no? Isn't that amazing? Because there's the, this theology floating around there that God, like, says no to, to, to things that are promises in the Bible. He doesn't. But anyway, that's a story for another day. He says, up till now, you haven't asked me anything. He said, but from now on, now that I'm leaving, I want you to ask what you have need of, of the Father. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Watch this. So that your joy will be full. So that your joy will be full. Nehemiah chapter 8 says this, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And there's a whole bunch of people that have split hairs and they'll say, well, joy and happiness are two different things. And I'm like, forget you, you kill joy. The point of the matter is that God wants us to be happy. He really does. He really does. I promise you. It's not his highest ambition, but he definitely wants us to be happy. So today, I want us to go to God's word. And find out what he says about how to lead a happy life. Enter into our text for today. And a season in David's life that is not such a shining moment. You know what I appreciate about the Bible and why I think the Bible is authentic? If you don't think it's authentic, that's okay. I think it's authentic. And here's one of the reasons why I think it's authentic. Is because the Bible doesn't just tell the good stuff. The Bible tells the bad stuff. How many of you know when somebody's lying, they always tell just the good stuff? You always know when somebody's lying. When there's no hiccups in the story, somebody, and somebody, when everything is just too perfect, it just lines up too good, and it's all highlights. Whenever it's all highlights, then you know somebody's, because can I just be honest with you? Nobody's story is a story of just highlights. Everybody's story has some highlights, and everybody's story has some lowlights, and if somebody's going to be really honest with you and just let you into their space and into their situation, they're going to just tell you the truth, and it's going to have highlights and lowlights. But the Bible tells about one of David's really low moments. It's his Bathsheba blunder. Bathsheba blunder. Maybe you've heard the story. David is the king of Israel. It's the true rags to riches story. David was a shepherd boy sleeping with sheep. One day he winds up being the king of the most powerful army, most powerful nation in all the world. And instead of sleeping with the sheep, he's sleeping on satin sheets in a palace. I mean, it is rags to riches. He is a war hero. The people like him. He is like a king that they actually want. They're singing songs about him in the streets. He's got everything going on. I mean, he's got the palace. He's got beautiful wives, which I don't still get that, to be, under, to under, to be honest with you. You know, who would want more than one wife? Guys, do you want more than one wife? Come on. I mean, one wife is enough. Two wives, crazy. Three wives, you're going to the loony bin. Ten wives, you're going to be locked up in a straight jacket. I, I love my wife very much, by the way, uh, and I'm just playing. But in any case, so he has everything that he needs, you know. And uh, one day when the kings were supposed to go out to battle, David decides to walk out on the balcony outside of his ensuite in the palace. And when he walks out, he looks down and he sees a woman taking a bath. Are you ready for this? You know what her name is? 
bath Sheba. Go figure. Don't tell me the devil is not at work, right? Like, just lying and circling. See, the devil will line stuff up for you, you know. I mean, David wasn't like, I'm going to go in and peek on somebody. But the devil will just feed your appetite. And see, the devil understands sometimes because of our hand, the hand that we tipped him, where our areas of weakness were. And day, one of David's areas of weakness was, David liked the ladies. And so he looks out and that's Bathsheba. And you would think that David, being appreciative of everything that God has done for him and what God has, has taken him from, would have just walked away and said, oh, man, would have sent one of his servants down there, female servants, by the way, would have sent one of his female servants down there, and I mean just because you don't send a male to check up on a female who's taken a bath. He sent another woman. And so he would send one of his female servants there to tell her, hey, you, you know, you shouldn't be bathing out here because, you know, you're showing your stuff up, you know, and nobody needs to see that stuff. Anyway, David sees, and David likes what he sees, and so he sends one of his servants down there to invite her to his crib, and they kick it, and she gets pregnant, and then they have a real problem. A real sis. Some of y'all, what does that mean, Pastor? Fill in the blanks. There might be some kids in the room, you know. I'm just trying to put it in adult language. In any case, she gets pregnant, and they got a real problem because David's married, and she's also married. And what makes matters even worse is that she's pregnant by David, who is best friends with her husband. Don't tell me the Bible is not authentic because you don't, you don't tell this kind of stuff. I mean, you, how many of you know you don't, you don't get out in the open and say, I just want to let everybody know what kind of dirtbag I was that I actually slept with my best friend's wife and got her pregnant. You don't tell that kind of stuff. You keep that stuff locked away. And so he gets her pregnant, and you would think when he finds out that she's pregnant that David would repent, own up to it, take his medicine, and then kind of go on with life. But David's like us. We think it's easier in life to cover stuff up than it is to come clean. Don't look at David in that tone of voice. We all feel this way. At least when this, when the vice is being clamped down on us, we think, our oh, first thing, how can we cover it up? How can we cover it up? How can we cover it up? And because we think cover-ups are easier than coming clean, and we're going to see today that cover-ups are not easier than coming clean. Cover-ups will wear you out in every way. And so David comes up with this really elaborate plan. And the first part of the plan is Uriah is out on the battlefield. He's fighting. And so he thinks, Uriah is my boy. I'm going to call him in from the battlefield, and I'm going to tell him when he gets here, hey, Uriah, the battle is under control, and because you're my boy, you know, I wanted to take you out of harm's way. And I have planned this amazing night for you and your wife. I bought you tickets to the show, tickets to the best restaurant. I got my servants ready for you. They're going to give you the spa treatment and everything like that. Why don't you have a romantic evening with your wife? Because David is feeling like he's coming in from the battlefield. He's been gone for months. Well, when daddy comes home after he's been gone for months, you know what's going to happen, right? David figures that once they get together, that he can blame the pregnancy on that night, and he's off the hook. And so Uriah comes in, and, and, he, and he's, you know, excited to hear what David has to say. And, and the Bible says he actually pounds his fist to his chest, and he says, my Lord and my king. David and Uriah were like this. He, David had Uriah as one of his 30 mighty men. Whenever David needed somebody by his side, Uriah was there. When David was on the run from Saul, Uriah was there. When David was hiding out in the cave of Adullam, Uriah was there with him. It's probably true that David was at the wedding of Uriah and Bathsheba. He probably made a toast because he was the king. And now he calls his friend and he says this to his friend. And his friend has got such deep character that he says, man, I appreciate that. But how could I enjoy myself when my other friends are out there on the battlefield and they're about to die? And he sleeps outside on the porch all night so that he could not go in and enjoy himself while his friends were suffering. And then David comes up with plan B. Because you would think that David would say, oh, man, God foiled my plan. By the way, when you try to cover something up and it gets foiled, you know what that is? That's God stopping, stopping you before you get in too deep. That's God stopping you before you get in too deep. And so David comes up with another plan. 
And, and another plan is that he says, I'll call Uriah back the next day. He didn't want to sleep with his wife when he was, you know, straight and everything. So I'll call him in and I'll say, listen, buddy, I haven't seen you in a while. You've been out on the battlefield. You deserve to take your ease. Let's have some brews together. This is in the Bible, by the way. It doesn't say kick it and bruise and all that kind of stuff. But the whole point is there, right? And, and he says, let's just, let's, just, let's just drink. He figures once that Uriah gets drunk, then he'll lose his inhibitions and he'll lose his sense of character and integrity and he'll just go in and sleep with his wife and then he's in the clear again. But Uriah says, man, I still can't do that. No. Now, you would think at this point, David is saying, man, I'm, I'm kicking against the pricks here. I, this, is, this is hard for me to get through. Maybe God is trying to stop me. Maybe David would realize God is trying to prevent him from entering the sin cycle. Not the spin cycle. The sin cycle. And, and the sin cycle will mess you up just as much as the spin cycle will. Uh, the washer, you imagine being in a washing machine just getting tossed around like that and so on. You're going to come out disoriented and messed up and all that kind of stuff. You're not going to come out clean. You're going to come out messed up because people don't belong in washing machines. <laughs> sin will mess you up. You know what the sin cycle is? Sin, first of all, will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. It'll cost you more than you're willing to pay. Here's the sin cycle. It starts off, fun, man, this is fun, this is amazing, this is amazing. Then, it ain't so fun no more. And then the last stage, I wish I never did that. The sin cycle. And you would think at this point that David would pump the brakes. They would say, no, what am I going to do here? I got to stop this madness. This is getting crazy. He's wearing himself out trying to cover it up. Do you know that it's harder to disobey God than it is to obey God? I know sometimes God asks us to do some challenging stuff that we don't want to do. You know, turn the other cheek, bless those that curse you. That's, that's hard stuff. I mean, that's graduate level Christianity right there. We don't want to do it. But how many know it is so much easier to obey God than it is to disobey God? When you disobey God, you got to cover your tracks. Who wants to try to cover their tracks all the time? Who wants to always look over their shoulder all the time? That's no way to live. And David is getting into this, and he gets sucked in even more. And now David comes up with the ultim ultimate sinister plan. David is no longer the war hero and the rags to riches story. He is a corrupt person. He is somebody who is selfish in every way, cares about nobody but himself, and he's moved into that space because sin will turn you into something that you are not. And not meant to be. And so he says, go back to the battle. Calls up one of his other boys. Joab, King David. What's up, man? He said, yeah, what can I do for you? He said, put Uriah on the front lines of the fiercest battle. He does. Uriah dies. He murders his own friend to cover up his sin craziness. He thinks he is in the clear. He thinks, all right, now there is no way that anybody can ever find out about what I did that was wrong. But how many of you know God loves us too much to allow us to live underneath the cover-up? God loves us too much to leave us in our sin. Even when we make a mess, God still makes a way. Isn't that amazing about God? Even when we make a mess, God still makes a way. And this is what excites me about the God of the Bible and why he's so much different than the God of religion because the God of religion says when you make a mess, you pay for it for the rest of your life. The God of the Bible says when you make a mess, you may suffer some consequences, but I still make a way because I specialize in taking messes and turning them into miracles. And so God sends the prophet Nathan to the house of David. And Nathan goes there and he tells him a little story. He says, uh, King, he says, uh, I want to ask your advice about something. There was this one poor man and he had this one little lamb that he loved so much. The lamb was a part of the family. I mean, this it was not a supper lamb. This was a lamb that they wanted to they let hang out in the house, slept in their bed, you know, fed in, with a bowl in the corner. It's kind of like their dog, you know, their lamb. He said there was this rich man had tons and tons of lambs. 
didn't really care too much about him. All he used those lambs for was for wool and to eat. And he said, and one day the rich man got hungry. And instead of killing his lamb, he took the poor man's lamb and he killed it and served it for dinner. And then Nathan says this, what do you think should happen to the man? And you know what David says? Kill him! Isn't that amazing? You and I are pretty good at seeing sin in somebody else's life, aren't we? We are tremendous at it. We have 2020 when it comes to other people's issues and other people's problems and what they should fix and how they should fix it and how they should go about it. But we have this blindness when it comes to our own ills and our own wrongs. And, and, and it's for, for them, it's a sin, but for us, it's a weakness. For, for them, they got an evil heart. For us, well, God knows our heart. God knows our heart. God, God knows I really didn't mean to do that, nothing like that. See, we have this wonderful way of, in the words of Jesus, picking out the specks in other people's eyes and missing the two-by-fours in our own eyes. Have you ever gone around a speck specialist? Come on, don't, don't we all, can we all agree, we all hate spe speck specialists, don't we? I mean, not hate in the true sense of the word, but, you know, we all just... You don't like them very much. They actually make me a little sick, turn my stomach just a little bit. They are modern-day Pharisees. Spec specialists, listen to me carefully, who are always pointing out the problems with everybody else, take it to the bank, have a ton of secret sins. Guarantee. Because somebody who is living for God and living right for God knows that they shouldn't be a spec specialist. They should be a restorer of people who are overtaken in sins. Those of you who are spiritual, the Bible says, when you see a brother or sister overtaken in the fall, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering your own self. So when people are spec specialists, oh, see that right there, they shouldn't be doing that. I can't believe Christians do that kind of stuff. They shouldn't even come to the house of God. can't believe they call themselves Christian like that. They give God a bad name by doing it. And just, just go off and on and just have a real party on that kind of stuff. We have this amazing way of pointing out all these issues in other people's lives and missing the issue in our own life. And, and here's what has happened to me over time. Maybe this has happened to you too. You live life and guess what life does? It humbles you. It humbles you. Because when you're 20-something and you don't know nothing. Sorry, 20-something people. You don't, you don't know nothing right now. That used to offend me when I was 20-something. But when you get to be 40-something or 50-something or 60-something or 70, it won't offend you no more. You'll be, ah, they, they're 100% right, you know. But, but when you're 20-something... You know, it's like, I would never, i I'd never do that, never, never do that, never do that kind of stuff. Uh-uh, not me, not me, not me. And then all of a sudden, you do that kind of stuff as life goes on. And, and when you first get married, it's like, I'll never get divorced. Never, 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 never get divorced. I can't understand how somebody can get divorced and do that to their kids and all that. And, and, and I can't, I can't, I can't. And, and when you first have children, not my child. My child will never, uh-uh, not my child. I, I, my, I know my child. And then you live life a little bit. And you live life and, and, and you're like, but for the grace of God, there go I. And uh, as far as I know, my child never does nothing like that. But, you know, uh, all of a sudden it starts changing your life. You begin to leave yourself a little bit of room, a little bit of room. And instead of pointing out people's problems, you, you drop to your knees and you pray for people when you see them going through problems because life has a way of humbling you. And David has not been humbled by by life yet. And so he is, kill the man, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. And Uriah says, David, you the man. You the man. Now we enter into the place of the story from which we read. David is in a happiness vacuum. He is depressed. He is full of sorrow. His world has fallen to pieces. And I say all that to say this. I know it's a little somber. It's a little deep right now. It's like, should I really come to church for this? Somebody could have invited me on a different subject, you know. But I'm going somewhere with this. I said all that to say this. Everybody has a story behind their sadness. Every single person. We all have things 
that have happened in the course of the life. Some people encounter them at an earlier stage than others, but, but as you live life, everybody encounters things and seasons and circumstances in life that lead to seasons of sorrow in life. And maybe for you it's an affair that you had or you were the victim of. Maybe it's an unplanned pregnancy. Maybe it's an ongoing sin that you're trying to keep a secret. Maybe it's a relationship that was never right. Maybe it's a tragedy or the loss of a loved one. Every single person has their own story behind their sorrow. We all have our reasons, but, but here's what I want to share with you today. There is hope. There is hope for you to be happy again. There is hope for you to experience wholeness again. There is hope to move beyond the hurt and hope that begins to heal the pain and bind up the brokenness. There is hope to be happy again. And that hope is found in God, in Jesus Christ, and in God's principles. And so we, we go into David's story here. And, and you'll recall that what David does is... Um, finds out that the child has passed on. And instead of continuing to mourn, he gets up, he washes his face, changes his clothes, he eats. And everyone's like, what is he doing? He is absolutely crazy. Can I translate it for you in, in just basic terms? David made a choice to live even after sorrow. David made a choice to live even after sorrow. And when you boil happiness down to one principle, if there were just one principle that I can give you of happiness, I'm going to give you more than one. Some of you are like, really? Um, but if I could only give you just one principle of happiness, here's the principle. Happiness is a choice. Happiness is a choice that we get to make despite our circumstances. Happiness is a choice that we get to live again even after sorrow, even after pain. We can live in the pain of the past. We can relive the pain of the past for the rest of our life. It doesn't change the pain of the past, but we can make a better choice, and the better choice is we can choose to live again despite the pain of the past or the pain of the present and move on again with life. And there's a famous story, if you think that that's kind of just like book stuff to say, about a man who was a psychologist named Viktor Frankl. He was a POW, prisoner of war, in World War II, he spent three years in a Nazi concentration camp. He was abused. He was underfed. He was mistreated. He was beaten. He slept on a bed with ten other people that was eight by six, no mattress, just wooden frame. That's how they had to sleep. People died at the direct hand of the Nazis. They would shoot them. They would bury them alive. They'd do all sorts of skin them alive, bake them in ovens, all sorts of stuff. And some people died of hopelessness. Viktor Frankl made it out alive. He went on to write a book, sold millions and millions of copies. He was asked the question, how did you make it out? Here's what he said. The last of human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way. What was he saying? Choose to be happy. Despite your circumstance, happiness is a choice. I know it's not easy, friends. I know there are certain things that are harder to move on from than other things. But at the end of the day, everybody has got a story behind their sadness. And at some point in life, if you are going to wear a genuine smiley face, not a church smiley face, but a genuine smiley face, you've got to choose to live again despite what you've come through, despite what has happened to you. Get back in again. Pick yourself up. Go forward again. And God will help you. Happiness is a choice. David didn't just choose to be happy. Just wanted, that's where it all begins, right? Nothing really happens until you choose. Because I've learned something in life. We can't make people do anything. You know, when I was a young preacher, I'd preach to people to try to make them do it. Now, you know what I do? I just put it out there. And, and I, this is what I like you to do. This is what I hope you choose to do. But I can't make you do anything. And we need to stop trying to think we can make people do stuff. Can't make people do nothing. All we can do is put some wisdom out there. And when we put some wisdom out there, wisdom wrapped in love, speak the truth in love, not the truth in hate. Next week, by the way, I would come back next week. Next week, we're going to talk about a different emoji, the emoji of hate. And how many of you know we need to learn about some hate right now in our society? 
We can't make people do anything. So David chooses, but then after he chooses, he chooses, he makes some powerful decisions. And here's this powerful decision that, that David made. He made the decision number two. You get a smiley face by choosing to repent. Not only did David make this choice, but, but Nathan comes to him, he says, you the man. And all of a sudden, the penny drops for David. All of a sudden, David comes to his right mind again. And David uh, learns that this is me, man. It wasn't somebody else. This is me who should be put to death. He comes to his sentence, senses. And can I just say to someone who may need to hear this right now, that no matter what you've done in your life, you can come to your senses. No matter how far you've drifted, no matter how bad it may be, you can come to your senses. In the words of Natalie Grant, her famous song, she says, I see shattered, you see whole. I see broken, you see beautiful. And you're helping me. You're restoring me piece by piece. There's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. You wash me in mercy. I am clean. She goes on to write, what was dead now lives again. My heart's beating, beating inside my chest. Oh, I'm coming alive with joy and destiny because you're restoring me piece by piece. There's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. You wash me with mercy. You make me clean. See, we think that if we come clean, if, if we repent before God, that, that it's, it's going to cause shame. But can I tell you what repentance is? It's not an action of shame. It's an action of courage. See, the reason why we, we don't come clean with God is because we think that if we come clean that we're going to experience all of these bad things. But repentance is actually the beginning of experiencing all of the good things that God has wanted us to have all along in our lives. And it's not an act of shame. It is a total act of courage. And repentance is so key to being happy because when we repent, something happens in our heart. Our heart becomes clean. Do you know that you can't have a corrupted heart, you can't have a covered heart and have a happy countenance. It is impossible to do. You can only fake it for a season, but you can't fake it forever. But what happens is when you repent, what you're harboring on the inside all of a sudden becomes clean. And when the inside becomes clean, it begins to emanate on the outside. And here's why Christians are some of the most miserable people in all the world. Because we have the Holy Ghost on the inside of us who's telling us right from wrong. And then we try to live with cover-ups. And the Holy Ghost on the inside of us is key. He tells us you can't do that. You can't do that. You got to come clean. You got to come clean. You got to come clean. got to come clean. And then we come into church after swearing at each other in the car and arguing at each other in the car and sending thumbs up or middle fingers up emojis to one another and, and effing one another on the phone and everything. We walk into church. Hey, brother, how you doing? You, you can't be happy with a, with a heart that's cluttered on the inside. And what, what repentance does is it clears out all that stuff. Because happiness comes from the inside. It doesn't come from the outside. David was reflecting back on his Bathsheba blunder. He writes Psalm 51. Here's what he says. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Can I encourage somebody who t today who may feel like, well, God can never forgive me. He can't. Pastor, you don't know what my story is. My story is really bad. Wait, just stop. David's story is not. Do you know why God picked the Davids to talk about in the Bible? Not because they were better than the people that we never heard of. But he picked the Davids because Dave, God picked the people who we couldn't look and say, well, that's why God forgave them because all they did was tell a little white lie. David didn't just commit adultery because that's kind of sadly common. David committed adultery with his best friend's wife. So God was like, let me get the worst kind I can get up in here. And then he murdered him. And the reason why God put him in there as one of our examples 
and who's, who God says, this is a man after my own heart. This is somebody I love. It's because God wants us to know that no matter what, God will accept us when we repent. And so David goes on to write in Psalm 51, he says, you will not reject a broken and a repentant heart, oh God. And so don't live in selfishness. Don't live in sin. Don't live in stubbornness. Don't live in that place. Come to God. The road to happiness is paved with the power of repentance. And repentance is, it's not easy because who wants to admit? Have you ever, have you ever done this? This happens to me sometimes. When I do things that I'm not proud of and then I get before God, I don't want to say what I did. I just want to ask God to forgive me. Does that happen to anybody else? I mean, because because you you try to say what you do, and then like you start to cringe. You're like, you know, you start. You just can't. You can't get it out there. It's like the Fonz. He could never say he was sorry, right? Or wrong, wrong, wrong. And and but we just it becomes hard for us. But the way back. It's paved with repentance. And when we repent, God God receives us. It's hard, though, to repent. And so what does God do? God gives us a tool to repent. And I'm not going to have time to finish this message today. I can't stand I'm not going to have time to finish this message today. Because the end of the message is so good. Try, try. But, you, look, some of you are like, don't say that. Shut up. I know you want to feel that way, but I don't feel that way. I never come to church. I've been in church today almost an hour already. I want to get out of here. Don't worry. I'm conscious of that. Because we don't like to repent, God gives us a tool to repent. One of the tools God gives us is a mirror. Mirrors are crazy things, aren't they? I used to love the mirror when I was 20-something. My mother would tell me, you are so narcissistic. You're just always looking in that mirror, you know, kind of stuff. Actually, my mother wouldn't tell me that. My uncle would tell me that. My mother would kind of stroke it a little bit because I would say things like, man, I need a license to go out looking this good. And, 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 <laughs> And, and, and my, my uncles would hear me saying that kind of stuff, and, and they'd be like, you know, you are so narcissistic. And now, I'm 46 right now, right? I said, I'm 46. That's where you say, really, Pastor? Are you kidding me? Seriously? You're 46? Uh, you missed your moment there to participate in the sermon. I hate mirrors now. Especially, and I got some big mirrors in my bathroom, huge mirrors in my bathroom. I can't get into the shower except walk by a mirror. And I hate it, man. I just, I have to wear the robe until I get right by the shower, you know, because I don't want to walk by the, because that mirror, as you get older, starts revealing all sorts of crazy things. Can I get a witness from anybody? And, and so... Why would God give us mirrors when God knows mirrors can, 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 can make you feel worse? I mean, sometimes I think, you know, my stomach's starting to go in a little bit. Feeling good. Then I walk by the mirror. I said, no, it ain't. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. So some mirrors, <laughs> some mirrors can, can just take you down. And you got to be careful what kind of mirror you look into. Because there's a lot of funhouse mirrors around. There's a lot of mirrors that will distort who you are and what you see and not give you happiness back but steal happiness from you. The mirror of other people is one of those fun house mirrors. Trying to figure out who you are by, by getting validation from other people is not, that's a fun house mirror. Starting to figure out who you are based on the principles and morals of this world, that's a fun house mirror. So God knows that, that mirrors can be cruel. So God gives us this, this magic mirror. Shout out to Michael, by the way. I'm looking at the man in the mirror. Some of you are like, what is he talking about? Some of y'all don't know no good music. The king of pop. And God gives us this mirror. It's called the Word of God. James talks about it, James chapter 1. And here's what he basically says. He says, whoever looks into this mirror... This, this mirror of liberty. In other words, this mirror sets you free. This mirror doesn't condemn you as it exposes you. Isn't that amazing? How could something not condemn us as it exposes us? Because everything that is exposed usually brings condemnation. But God has this funny way of not condemning us when we are exposed, but causing us to become something that we should be even though we may not be that thing right now. Because the mirror of the Word of God doesn't just reflect back to us the flaws and the failures in our life. It gives us this 
picture of who God intends for us to be. And this picture of who God intends for us to be is so bright and so magnificent and so wonderful that what happens is we willfully strive for this picture and this picture overshadows the picture that exposes our faults and our faults disappear not because we are striving not to sin but we are striving to become like Christ and in the effort to become more like Him all of the things that we don't want to see don't have as much as much power over us as they once did. And so the key to repentance is looking at the Word of God. That's why we hold up our Bibles. That's why we say what we do. That's why I don't preach to you stuff that is my own opinion. I try to base it on the Word of God because this is what's going to set you free in life. And repentance is one of those things. The third thing I want to share with you, third thing, rely on the Holy Spirit. If you need to be happy, you need to rely on the Holy Spirit. Did you notice what happened in the exchange between David and his mighty men or in his servants? They said, what are you doing, man? David says, well, the child was alive. I fasted and I wept for her. I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me and then that the child may live? But now he's dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. His servants were saying, David, you got to stay focused on the pain. What, why aren't you focused on the pain? And somehow, supernaturally, did you catch this? I don't know how it happened, but somehow, supernaturally, David didn't focus on the pain. David focused on the promise. Somehow, in the middle of David's pain, David got this understanding of seeing this child again. I will go to this child. He got, he got a focus on heaven in the midst of the greatest type of pain. How did that happen? Because, listen... The Holy Ghost, even though he didn't live in David like he lives in us underneath the new covenant, was still working through them back in Bible days. And the job of the Holy Ghost is to remind us of God's promises in the middle of our pain. Because if you are ever going to be a happy person, you've got to be promise-focused in life and not pain-focused in life. Because if you keep reliving the pain, you'll be sad your entire life. So, if you're healthy, rely on the promise of divine health. If you get sick, rely on the promise of healing. If someone you love dies and is not healed, rely on the promise of eternal life. For whatever your situation is, God's got a promise. If life is going good, rely on the promise that no evil thing shall come near you. If a bad circumstance comes your way, rely on the promise that God will deliver you. If God doesn't deliver you as quick as you had hoped for, rely on the promise that God will take all things and turn them for your good, that he will use the circumstance for your benefit. For whatever your situation is, there is always a promise, not because God is fickle, but because life happens haphazardly. And God knows that our humanity and the world we live in is going to cause some things to happen one way for some people and some things to happen one way for another people. And so it's not that God was covering himself. God was covering us. And he was saying, here's a promise for that, and here's a promise for that, and here's a promise for that, and here's a promise for that. And David is living proof of this amazing truth that even when we lose, we win. Isn't that amazing about God? Even when we lose, we win. When the Cowboys beat the Giants tonight, there's going to be no, no, even when we lose, we win. It's just going to happen, right? But, but even when we lose, we win. And man, you need this message because tonight you are going to be sad. Sad, 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 sad. <laughs> why, why is David... Why is David proof that even when we lose, we win? He's proof that even when we lose, we win because even though he didn't get what he wanted, he got eternal life. He got something that mattered for all of eternity. Listen, don't be so short-sighted into thinking that this life is all that there is. If you get all your wins now, but don't stack up your wins later, you will be the most miserable of all people because you can't change it when eternity comes your way. But you can change it now. And so I want to encourage encourage you, live in the promised land. Live in the promised land. The whole Old Testament 
is about God taking the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. It was God's mission. And we don't have the same kind of promised land, right? Because there is no land that we go to that is this amazing land, although many would consider America to be that land. But we have promises of God that He wants us to live in. And I want to encourage you to live in your promised land. Live in your promised land. I'm going to give you one more. It'll take me two or three minutes. But this is going to change somebody's life. I won't give you both two more. I'll give you just one more. If you're going to be happy, you need to rewrite your story. If you're going to be happy, you need to rewrite your story. Listen, listen, listen. What happens with us is we tell our story based on what has happened to us. And, and so, and I'm not talking about tell our story to other people, but tell our story to ourselves because that's really what matters most, right? What you tell other people usually is not really the truth anyway. Just being real, okay? But what you tell yourself is really what happened, but it ain't the truth either. But you, we tell ourselves a story based on what's happened to us. So we say, I am abused. I, I, I am taken advantage of. I am divorced. I, I am a widow. I am a widower. I am um, all these things. We tell our story based on what's happened to us. I'm an addict. And then because we tell our stories based on what happened to us, we define ourselves in light of what's happened to us. And so we go and we say things like, well, I'm broken. I'm hurt. I'm unworthy. I'm dumb. I'm stupid. I'm not worth it. And David teaches us something powerful as he reflects back on his Bathsheba moment because David could have defined himself as I am a murderer and I am an adulterer and I am a, I'm thinking of a bad word right now that I can't say in church. Say, Pastor, you're really thinking of that? Yes, I really am. It's the first thing that came to my mind. I need to renew my mind too. I'm not saying I'm perfect. You ought to be lucky I didn't say it. Because you imagine if I said it, people, I'm not going back. I mean, you got 60 minutes of liquid gold. If I cursed once, it would rock some of y'all's world. <laughs> Crazy Christianity. David is looking back on his Bathsheba moment. And he says this, he says, create in me a clean heart. Oh God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast away your presence from me. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And in the middle of his repentance, verse number 12, he says, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Watch this. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. I'm like, say what? My man has got himself in the position of instructing other people after he has done what he's done. Say what? Really, David? I said, what is going on? David figured something out. David figured out how to write his story. He didn't write his story based on what has happened to him. He has written his story based on what, is, what God is going to do as a result of what he's been through in his life. And so David goes into this situation and he writes the story from the perspective of the goodness of God. God is going to take what I've been through and he's going to use me now to teach transgressors that when you sin, it ain't fun. And when you sin, it takes you further than when you want to go. And when you sin, it'll cost you more than you want. God is going to redeem my story. And I'm telling somebody, today. You need to rewrite your story, not from what has happened to you, but from the perspective of what God has done for you. And you need to start looking at yourself and saying, I am forgiven. You need to look at yourself and say, I am restored. You need to look at yourself and say, I'm set free. You need to look at yourself and say, God loves me. I have a destiny that cannot be stopped. Stop defining yourself. Based on what has happened to you, you are not broken. You are blessed. You are not hurting. You are healed. You are not overlooked. You are an overcomer. You are not a victim. You are victorious. Define yourself. 
You're not the person that failed. You're the person that has God's favor. You're not the person who God doesn't love. You're the person that Jesus died for. You're not unworthy. You're a king's kid. You're a daughter. You're a son of Almighty God. Define yourself. Rewrite your story. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing I know about our stories. People are always going to try to write your story. This is why I stopped Googling myself. Because at the end of the day, what, what they say doesn't even matter. What matters most is what God says. But even more is what I say. Because God can say, and if I don't accept what God says about me, and I don't tell myself that particular thing, then I can never become happy. I can never live a smiley face. And so here's the good news. You get to write your own story. Can I ask you a question? Or can I give you a, a, a suggestion? Let God move the pen. Let God move the pen. Don't just write what, write what God says. God, God thinks so much more highly of us than we think. Let God begin to move the pen. And here's what I know about God. God is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the writer of our story. Let take the pen that God has already got and begin to let him move and rewrite your story. And when you do, you watch how you will have a smiley face. God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be happy.